Hello and welcome to the Car Kerala channel. In today's video, we're going to do a technical review on a very controversial car, the 2020 Toyota Supra. We're going to check out some of the cool features and the technologies that this car have. And yes, many people say this is a BMW, and folks, I will not lie to you. It is, but it's a cool BMW with a Toyota badge, so we are interested. We're going to go over some of the cool features of the engine, the transmission, and a general tour, a technical tour of the car. As a Toyota Master Diagnostic Technician, I was chosen to be the super specialist at my Toyota dealership. Before we dig into the technical review, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Consider subscribing to the channel, check out some of my other videos. If you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. Without further ado, let's go check this car out. So under the hood of the Supra is a 3.0-liter inline-six turbocharged. This, folks, is not a new engine that is exclusive to the Supra. It is actually a B58 engine from BMW. It's arguably the word BMW with Toyota doesn't uh, chime very well with Toyota folks, but it's actually one of the better engines from BMW, so we'll give it that. Benefit of the doubt here, folks. So this engine is designed with a technology package, if you would, called TVDI, so turbocharged Valvetronic Direct Injected. This engine is direct injected only, and I'll take you on a tour of a few components when we start talking about them. But this engine has a twin scroll single turbocharger, has direct injection only, and also has Valvetronic and variable valve timing. In BMW world, the variable valve timing is not called VBTI, it's Vanos. So let's talk about Valvetronic. So Valvetronic can adjust the valve lift on these engines. So it changes how much the valves open. Yes, not when they open, how far they open. They are going to open just a little bit, too much. And, and that is something similar with Toyota's Valvematic system. But of course, this one is geared more towards performance. Now, the cool thing about this engine is, with Valvetronic, it could actually control the idle of the engine or the speed of the engine. So you'll see the valve body just opens all the way and stays open. And the thing can idle itself down because of the valve tronic. That is something really cool and definitely new to the Toyota world. Some of the cool features of this engine is a cooling system. Let's talk about that for a little bit. So your normal car will have a thermostat. Engine reached operating temperature. The thermostat opens, lets the coolant, and that's how it controls the temperature. Not with this engine. This engine has no thermostat, and instead it has a very over-engineered valve, which works great for now, that distributes the coolant flow according to where the engine needs it to be. For example, when you first start the engine cold, there is no coolant flow. It's just circulating around the water pump. As the engine starts warming up, it could distribute the coolant to cool the cylinder head or the block individually. It could also isolate the coolant from the heater core so you get no heat. And by doing that, it could actually optimize the cooling of this engine. So you would have only cooling when you need it. The block will warm up faster because of the combustion, the cylinder head, if you need heater, if you need rapid warm up. So what that does is it makes these engines warm so rapidly. It is amazing how quickly these engines warm up and how efficiently they do so. And speaking of cooling systems, so there are two cooling systems in this engine in general. There is the high temperature cooling circuit and then there's the low temperature cooling circuit. As you see right here, there's two bottles of coolant, one for the high, one for the low. So as we talked about, this engine is turbocharged, and every turbocharged engine will have an intercooler to cool down the charge from the turbocharger. The intercooler in this car, not like your old Supra, where it was cool and it was huge and it was mounted in the front, this one actually integrates the intercooler inside the intake manifold. If you notice, the intake manifold is very big on this engine. That's because it houses the intercooler, which is coolant cooled. It doesn't need the airflow from the outside. So the intercooler operates on the low temperature circuit. 
and the high temperature circuit is going to be for the turbochargers, the engine, the heater, and everything else. But going back to the low temperature cooling circuit, and something really cool about this car, it does not have a, an AC condenser. It's not an air cooled AC condenser. It actually have a coolant cooled AC condenser. A uh, unit about yay big, and it has some of the coolant from the low circuit going to it to cool the AC. It acts as a condenser, like a liquid cooled condenser, which I think that was pretty cool, and I wish more cars would do that. Let's talk about the Vanos or variable valve timing. From a design standpoint, we all know how variable valve timing works, changes the valve timing as needed for efficiency and performance. But the different things about this engine, and this might not be new for BMW, but in Toyota world, this is uh, interesting because most Toyota engines, the cams, this is obviously an overhead cam engine, but the cam gears, which have the variable valve timing, which they change the, the timing, they're in the front of the engine. So in, a, in this configuration engine, not a transverse si side mounted engine, if you would, the gears would be in the front, but not in the Supra. The Supra, the, uh, the B58 engine, the, the gears are all the way in the back where you can't service them and they're uh, fun, fun to do for me when they go bad, which since uh, I really hope BMW did this right because they look like fun. As you can see in this picture, it's an odd looking location for these gears. And I understand that some German manufacturers actually do this across the board, but it was interesting to have a car with a Toyota badge that has something like that. Speaking of odd things, let's talk about engine oil. This is the official oil for the Supra and it's 0W20, very expensive and it says Toyota Gazoo Racing. Now, something about the oil change for this car, the recommended interval is 10,000 miles in one year or a condition-based service. So this one is actually not like your average Toyota. This will uh, look at your driving style and how often you drive your car and cold starts and this and that. And it'll actually give you an cha oil change interval based on your driving conditions. So that's, I guess, uh, would be nice if Toyota's had that. However, there is no dipstick. And a lot of people have voiced concern over this. It's like, how come this engine has no dipstick? This is such a simple thing. Well, um, this is a guess. Uh, BMW owners, especially newer ones, they might not be very interested in checking their oil in their suit and tie regularly. So perhaps that's the reason, but there must be a reason for them to do that because if you think it is cost, it is not because the sensor that measures the oil is probably more expensive than a, just a dipstick tube and a little plastic dipstick. So this is the reason the Supra has that. And there's one thing I would like to bring to your attention on this. You can check the oil level in the instrument panel on the screen. Well, it can know when the level is low, but it can't know when it's overfilled. So you gotta be careful with these engines. And recently, we've been uh, getting some reports of Supras having low oil issues, whether they're burning or they were not filled properly, it's still unclear. But if you own one of these, you're gonna wanna check that oil level or start the measurement on the screen more often to make sure you have the correct oil level in these things at all times. Let's take a closer look at the engine. So this is the valve cover, it is plastic, which uh, seems to be a normal thing for BMW to use, although Toyota now is using one too. Uh, it's very, things are, they look intimidating here, but they're actually not as intimidating. You have six ignition coils right here, but then the odd thing about this is, and usually you'll not find this in Toyota land, is the direct injectors are also on top. The rail is right here, it's actually two rails. There's a lot of special tools involved to removing these, and they tend to be a little bit difficult to replace. But the problem is, in my opinion, every time you have to replace a valve cover gasket, which uh, is not very common with BMW, yeah, it is. You're gonna have to remove these injectors, which is uh, not ideal. So that's one uh, negative thing about it. Right here, you have your high pressure fuel pump. And otherwise, things are pretty normal here. You got your some PCV 
hoses, just general wiring looks very intimidating, but it's actually not very intimidating. On this side of the engine, you notice this is the intake manifold. It is pretty big because it has the intercooler inside. Over here, you got the two coolant bottles, the high temperature and the low temperature. Many people have wondered what's the difference. It's the same coolant that is in here. It's made by BMW, of course, but they're just two separate circuits. Your complicated condenser, or actually the cool condenser, sits right here. Throttle body, of course, with the BMW logo on it. For DIY guys, the oil filter is all the way in the back. You just remove this, get a wire harness out of the way, and then your oil filter is right there. And of course, the engine computer is right here. And then, last but not least, here's a single twin scroll turbocharger. If you remove the intake, upper and lower covers, you'll actually get good access to them. They don't seem very extremely difficult to remove. They're, the exhaust manifold is part of the turbo, so they're both one unit for efficiency, for compactness, and it's a rather simple turbocharger, if you would. And the battery in this car is buried all the way in the trunk. So if you need to jumpstart this car, the positive terminal is right here and the negative terminal is right here. At least that is simple. So let's talk about the transmission in the Supra. It's an eight speed automatic transmission, torque converter. It's called the 8HP51. It's made by a company called ZF. And in my book, ZF is as good as ASIN when it comes to regular Toyota transmissions. They're really good transmissions. They don't have many problems. They're really geared for high power and they're actually, believe it or not, they're not exclusive to this car. You'll find them in so many cars that it would surprise you. There is a variant of this transmission in your Jeep Wrangler, the newer stuff, and the Gladiator, and the list goes on and on. Just search for this transmission. You'll see that it's widely used in so many makes and models of cars that makes it very common, more common than your ASIN transmissions that are almost exclusive to Toyota. Now, one thing odd about this transmission, and actually that goes across the board for all these transmissions, all these ZF transmissions and their variants and different models. This transmission, the parking pawl, doesn't have a release, if you would. It's not like you have a cable where you shift it and, and it goes out of park and releases that parking pole. The most interesting thing about this transmission is it is always engaged. The parking pole is always engaged, normally engaged. Hydraulic pressure pulls the parking pole out to disengage it. So if you lose hydraulic pressure, the car goes into park and it'll never come out. If for whatever reason you can't start the engine or at least turn it to create enough pressure in the transmission, you can get this thing out of park. So in most cars that have this transmission, there is some kind of release somewhere where under the floor mat, somewhere around the car where you can just pull a manual release and pull the car out of park in case of emergencies. But uh, not in the Supra. And their idea of an emergency release is where you are gonna crawl under the car, use a little tool to push a little arm and put a little other tool to hold it out of park. Well, unless you are the size of a squirrel, you can't crawl under the Supra. So that was not a very good idea. That was the, will be the only thing that'll not make people happy when you have an emergency and the car doesn't start, now you can't even get it out of park to push it, let alone get underneath it and try to disengage that parking pole. And the transmission fluid that it uses, at least for the Supra, I'm pretty sure there's multiple variants of this fluid, is a BMW fluid, and it's rather expensive. So the replacement procedure, you just take the drain plug, drain the fluid, and then there's another plug on the side of the transmission is where you fill from. And just like any sealed transmission, the temperature range is 86 to 122 Fahrenheit. Once the transmission is in that range, you take that second plug you filled from, it'll dribble out, cycle through gears, let it dribble out a little bit more, and life is good. It's actually even almost simpler than regular Toyota transmissions. Yes, you do need a scan tool to check the temperature and pressure, but 
I think this is actually a good transmission in this car, other than the parking pole situation that is just for the Supra because they didn't uh, make a manual release that is easy to access. Let's talk about the differential. So in most cars, the differential is just a giant chunk of metal with a uh, few gears inside and life is good. Some cool differentials, they'll have a limited slip differential where it'll lock both wheels to slip when you make turns. Life is good. But in the Supra, BMW, I mean Toyota decided to take it to another level. And likely I am not familiar with BMW's other models, but this is the only BMW we know in Toyota land. So the differential is a limited slip, but not a mechanical limited slip. It's an electronic limited slip, so it has a clutch pack inside and the computer can control which wheel gets how much to slip each wheel and how, when to lock them together. That is pretty cool because it this car is not your uh, drive your kids to school type car. This is a sports car, performance car, so of course it will benefit from that greatly. The strange thing about the differential is because of that multi-disc and clutch and all this uh, slight German complication, there is a calibration for those. So you don't just go replace them and call it a day like you would in any other car with a differential. There's actually a calibration for these discs. Every time you replace them or you do any service, you got to calibrate it. You got to, of course, see the dealership for the scan tool. Speaking of the scan tool, let's move to the next section and talk about service and common problems. So let's talk about service and maintenance for these cars and then we'll talk about the common problems that I see. So in my dealership, I work exclusively on these cars because I'm the only person in my dealership trained to do so. Every dealership will have one technician. Some dealerships that have big volume of these will have two. The first thing about service is this car does not use our beloved TechStream scan tool. It actually uses ISTA, which is the BMW scan tool. However, you can't just get the BMW scan tool and it'll work right off the bat. They had some kind of deal between them because the ISTA that we use at the dealership is Toyota ISTA. So when you open it up, it's different colors, not blue and gray, it's actually red and gray, and it says Toyota at the top. Now we tried to use this scan tool on a BMW, it did not communicate with it, and I imagine that the BMW one will do the same thing with the Supra. So you're gonna, you're uh, stuck having me work on this car if you have one and you need a scan tool. Having said that, of course, the scan tool is completely different than our tech stream, but I think it's a pretty innovative tool. It takes a little bit of a learning curve, but after some training and some hands-on time, it, it's okay. It can do a lot more than your tech stream, but also it does not allow you to do much because it has guided diagnostics, unlike tech stream where it just gives you the data and you as the technician do the work. This one, it doesn't. Another thing on maintenance, and this is the maintenance intervals, if you would. The engine oil, we set 10,000 miles, one year. I'll hold that loosely, it's up to you. But uh, the transmission is lifetime, hopefully. Let's talk about some of the maintenance items. Now, people will ask, well, is this a DIY car? Probably not, because they're so low to the ground and lifting them is a little bit of an interesting proposition because there's such a short wheelbase. But as far as oil changes, they're very simple. There's just a little cover you remove and here's the drain plug and then the oil filter. Very easy to get to, standard stuff. To reset the condition-based service, you can do it through the instrument cluster only when the thing has passed the interval. Otherwise, you need a scan tool. If, you, like, if it hasn't told you you need service, you can't reset it until you pass the service interval, which is kind of odd, but that's the way it is. Brake fluid replacement every 20,000 miles, transmission seal for life, hopefully. And some of the maintenance item, the fluid maintenance, is rather simple, but does require a scan tool here and there. So that's the only thing that would stop this car from being DIY. The biggest thing is the battery. And this is where things kind of leave the DIY realm. Typically, most DIY mechanics will start 
we'll change batteries, fluids, this and that. Well, the oil change, simple enough. Everything else, not really, especially the battery. So the battery sits all the way in the back and it's a massive battery. But the problem is every time you replace that battery, you need to program it. That's just thank you BMW for that. Which brings us to the common problems with these cars that I've seen. Some of these cars still have nine, 8,000 miles, but the one behind me actually have 27,000 miles and this car is only driven in the summer. You, I don't know if you'd wanna drive this in snow. So, so far they have been generally reliable with a few annoying things and some problems trending today. Let's talk about the first one, the battery. Now you store this thing over winter, the battery dies. That's okay, it happens. Maybe you forgot to put a battery maintainer, whatever the case may be. Well, you charge your battery, start the car, it says to replace battery. Okay, but I charge the battery. Well, that's a common thing with these when once they go into that replace battery mode, if you would, or they get stuck there until you reprogram the battery to the car, which can be pretty annoying when you forgot your battery maintainer or you just forgot it and the battery died. And the batteries die pretty quick in this, even though it's a giant 950 cranking amp battery, they still die pretty quick. So that's kind of an annoying problem. Every time your battery dies, you charge it, you gotta go to the dealer, program it, come back, kind of becomes annoying. Not a serious problem though. Let's talk about the next one that we've seen a lot actually. Transmission leaks from the transmission pan. It's either the gasket or the drain plug of the plastic transmission pan. But that's not also a big deal. Just drain the fluid. Fluid is very expensive. You are warranty on this one. Uh, that's going to be uh, quite an expense in fluid. But it's not the end of the world. You'll have a little bit of a leak, as you can see in this picture. Just take the transmission pan, replace it. It actually comes with the filter built into it and the gasket. So it's just one unit, comes with everything. You just, that's the only part you need. It even comes with new bolts. And then the last issue, which is now a new trending problem that is pretty serious. Oil level going low and people not paying attention to it until you get the message on the dash. Folks, if you drive one of these cars, you're gonna wanna do that start measurement and have the engine recheck the oil level constantly because this is a trending problem. And there are a few reports of engine actually having damage from low oil level. So just letting you know, if you own one or you're considering buying one, that's a trending problem with these. Otherwise, there's a few recalls on them. None of them are really big or serious or involve big replacements or anything other than the initial one that kind of stopped these cars from being sold with the seat belt, something with the structure. They didn't even give us a lot of details on these, but there was a few software updates and that's about it. Folks, before we wrap up this video, I'd like to give a huge shout out to the owner of this car. I really appreciate him bringing the car in so we can have this video and film with the car. I hope you like this video. I hope you learned something new. I hope you can get past the, part, the fact that this is a BMW. Look, folks, I understand that this made a lot of hardcore Supra fans upset. And I was one of them. Why couldn't Toyota do their own Supra? However, after you drive this car and check it out, I think they did really good. And yes, this car is BMW from front to back. There are, however, two things that are not BMW. We're very proud of them in Toyota land. Of course, the body, that's the obvious stuff, but there are two more parts that says Toyota specifically on them. Only two, if you know more, let me know. There is the reverse light that says Toyota, and then the uh, door molding that also says Toyota. Otherwise, everything says BMW or says some random supplier's name. That's just the way it is. I think it's a beautiful car, beautiful car to drive and a proper sports car. However, it's a BMW underneath and we're just gonna have to live with that. Well, I hope you learned something new and I hope you liked this video. If you did, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber to the channel, consider subscribing, check out some of my other videos. And until the next video, may the Lord bless you and keep you and you have a wonderful day.